Hello there, this is Robert of MayflowerBookshop.com and I'm here to share from a book called Man in the World of Stars, Rudolf Steiner delivered talks, delivered in Dornach. The specific one is from the Spiritual Communion of Mankind and the title of the talk is Spiritual Knowledge is a True Communion Spiritual knowledge is a true communion, the beginning of a cosmic cult suitable for men of the present age. New Year's Eve, 1922-23, it was a talk given the very time, right after this talk, right after this talk, the Gertianum was um, burnt down. Somebody had arsoned it. Fire was discovered about an hour after the lecture had finished. And once reminded by the title of this talk of the Templars, who Rudolf Steiner thought were the guardians of the Holy Grail, and who are said to have refused communion, taking communion, they did not participate with communion in the church because they felt they were always in communion. They were always at one meant, like instead of atonement, at one. With the good, true, and beautiful Christ, the Christos, the God, perhaps even the, the Hermes Christos Sophia, if you will. So this is me... <laughs> reading this talk to you with my comments. Obviously. Okay, let's go for the ride. Spiritual knowledge is a true communion, the beginning of a cosmic cult suitable for men and women, I assume, of the present age. The day before yesterday... I spoke of how the cycle of the year can also be found in the human being. I point out, pointed out that the forces of nature around us group themselves into a sort of time organism, which we call the cycle of the year, so that we can see during the course of a year the interaction and cooperation of occurrences which otherwise appear like isolated processes and facts in nature. I might add that in Dr. Steiner's talks on human and cosmic metamorphosis, he speaks of the three meetings with the Trinity, that every night we go to sleep via the Holy Spirit, via our guardian angel into the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. We meet the Holy Spirit each night. The Spirit of what is going on, past, present, future, lifetime, what was, is, and always will be. A golden meeting every night, if you know how to do it. And <clears throat> when you're around 30 on the Saturn return, there's a meeting with the Father. Whereas each night we meet the Holy Spirit, around 30 we meet the Father and the, and the, the mysteries of death or at one minute or rebirth, death and rebirth. And in the course of the year, There's a wonderful poem by A.E. George Russell, Irish theosophist and lover of the land, pre-Doogie MacLean. And it's called The World Breath, I believe. So Steiner talks about, in Cosmic and Human Metamorphosis, there's, and, and of course in the cycle of the year and its agricultural four seasons in the archangels that the earth takes a whole year to breathe. It breathes out 
from the winter solstice or Christmas time on. And I won't go into it in detail, but I believe that from my research that the solstice to Christmas, that these four days are a recapitulation of the four earth evolutions. Uh, you'll, you'll see me refer to this in my book, Astrological Aspects, the Art, a rough, pretty much unedited book, but yet tons of ideas. And uh, not only an astrological cookbook, but a synthesis of Tibetan Buddhism, Theosophy, Hermetics, Rudolf Steiner, Neoplatonism, maybe. And so Christmas to New Year's is a recapit recapitulation of the four Earth evolutions that bring us into the state of I am here and I have a sense of the past and future that is constantly reinterpreted depending on the quality of consciousness I can make present here. So Rudolf Steiner talks about in Cosmic and Human Metamorphosis this meeting of the Christ and the easiest way of developing one's own clairvoyance, which actually means clear seeing. It's not a psychic weird thing. Clairvoyance is perhaps Ralph Waldo Emerson's common sense. Clarity, clear seeing, how the material and spiritual worlds work into the everyday and how the everyday works into a more eternal touch of things. So in the cycle of the year, the earth breathes out and that breath, that earth breath rises above the ground in spring equinox, Easter, Ishtar time, Astarte time, and makes an offering to the heavens um, at summer solstice in St. John's time and July 4th time. There's an offering to the heavens, which fireworks are kind of an aromatic and luciferic interruption. Uh, these are kind of anth anthroposophical terms and have nothing to do with w what is over-materialized as a sense of a devil or something. At a one-on-one -on -one level, there is no God unless we prove it by the way we live. And there is no devil outside of ignorance of the true nature of self and delusion about the true nature of the other. all of which wisdom and compassion, a sense of selfless learning and compassion for all who suffer, has a way of furthering and awakening a higher consciousness to look forward to, to enter the, to, to live for. and to future us into an ever better situation, opportunity for enlightenment. So I don't, I don't mean to get you lost here. I'm just giving you a little bit of side <clears throat> angle and circumference and a couple points. Uh, the main point being the earth breathes out and the light increases after the winter solstice and the earth breathes up and makes it an offering of the garden of friendships and actual physical gardens, really flowers offering to the sky and then there's a there's this kind of turning around and there's uh, a contraction into the breath returning to the earth or falling from the heavens it is an offering up to the heavens and then the breath contracts and when springtime comes you can see the you can see the little green plants coming up with the breath and you can see the leaves forming and the sap rising, and now everything kind of falls. We enter fall or autumn, autumn, autumn raw. And it contracts back into the deep inner experience where the earth is alive at Christmas time and New Year's time inside. Okay, so this is perhaps what Rudolf Steiner is talking about. 
at this point, and I thought I'd say it, this nature cycle. Now, the essential difference between this nature cycle and its image in man is that events which take place successfully and um, successively in a particular region of the earth take place concurrently in man. He's talking man generically. It's man and woman. This was a way of speaking. And, um, and originally, whether it's woman or man, uh, the real meaning of all that is not a sexual meaning or differentiation of the sexes. It's ma- man is manas. It's thinker. So you could say that the image in thinker, man, man, manas, is that events which take place success- successively, successively, in a particular region of the earth take place concurrently in man. Man, it is true, taken as a whole, resembles the earth globe taken as a whole, inasmuch as when it is winter in one hemisphere, it is summer in the other, and so forth. In the case of the earth, however, if we take the winter influences as they work in one region, and the simultaneous summer influences working in another region, the two flow away from one another, and neither is disturbed or weakened in its operation by the other. But now consider how it is with man. When he is asleep, his physical and etheric bodies are in a kind of summer condition, a budding and sprouting life. Spiritual sight shows us this budding and sprouting summer condition of man's physical and etheric bodies during sleep. When the ego and astral body are separated from them, we can say that while the human being is asleep, there is a kind of successive spring and summer condition in the physical and etheric organism which he has left behind. Steiner, in The Four Seasons in the Archangels, I'm commenting, goes into how Michael, the Archangel of Fall, and you'd have Raphael um, doing the Fall within us, you know, so there's Fall on the outside, but there's Spring on the inside. And, <clears throat> okay, so I think you get a little bit of it. Steiner's very complex until you get it, and then it looks really simple. We can say that while the human is asleep, there is a kind of successive spring and summer condition in the physical and etheric organism, which he has left behind. At the same time, the ego and astral body, which still cooperate in supporting the human organism as a whole, are in a sort of winter condition. Thus, here again, there are simultaneous summer and winter conditions But in man, they are not turned away from one another. On the contrary, they work into one another. And it is the same in our waking life. As long as the human is awake, his physical and etheric bodies are in a kind of autumn and winter condition. Yeah, when we're awake, the ego and the astral body are like making us real aware of ourselves and others and conscious, right? Okay, standard. Their organic life is waning, so to speak. When man is awake, physical and etheric are in that autumn winter. On the other hand, the ego and the astral body, stirred by external impressions and by the thoughts to which these impressions give rise in man, are in full summer and full spring conditions. So that once more we find inner spring, inner summer, and inner winter working together in man not turning away from one another, but irradiating each other. This is what actually takes place as disclosed by the researches of spiritual science. If we wish to compare the entire earth with man in respect to winter and summer, we should have to turn the summer in one hemisphere right round and superimpose it on the winter in the other hemisphere. Were this possible, we should have actually what may be described as summer conditions canceling winter conditions and winter conditions canceling summer conditions, producing a kind of equilibrium. 
Now, this is an important fact, not yet realized by external science, which, in consequence, is bound to misunderstand the essential nature of the human being. For in man, summer and winter, if I may allow myself the expression, for it really corresponds to what actually takes place, cancel one another. It is true that man bears surrounding nature in himself, but its activities cancel one another and a condition sets in which actually brings the activities of nature to a state of rest. Even as in a balance that has weights on in, in either scale, the pointer will come to a rest at a certain spot and will at that spot be affected neither by the weight to the right nor the weight to the left, but there will be equilibrium in respect to the forces which otherwise affect the beam. So there is in man a counterpoise resulting from opposing natural forces. Anyone who studies what I said very briefly in my book, Riddles of the Soul, about man as a threefold being, studying it really carefully, as people are not yet accustomed to do, will find that what I am now going to say is true. Man is membered into an organism of nerves and sense, a rhythmic organism, and an organism of trunk, limbs, and metabolic Meta metabolism. These three organisms, nerves and sense, rhythmic organis organism, heart, lung, and an organism of trunk, limbs, and met metabolic, these three organisms work together and into one another. We may say that the organism of nerves and senses has its principal activity in the head, but the whole of man is head after a fashion, functionally. You can see at this point, this my comment, you can see this point where somebody might be so disturbed and bored that they might get weirded out. <laughs> okay, that was a joke. Rudolf Steiner used to tell humorous things at the beginning of his talks in the middle and the end, and they're about, um, but the stenographers took it out. Okay, so. So, the whole of man... Um, where did I go? The whole of man is head after a fashion functionally, and the same may be said of the other systems. If we take the two outer organisms, that of the nerves and senses, and that of the trunk, limbs, and me metabolic activities, we find an actual opposition between them which is very plainly visible to a spiritual, scientific anatomy and physiology. Say, for example, we are walking. There is motion in our limb organism, movement in space. To this motion, there corresponds in a certain portion of our nerves and sense organism, our head organism, a kind of rest, proportional to the amount of activity or movement in our limb organism. Please try to understand this correctly. I said a proportional amount of rest. Rest is generally thought of as absolute. A person who is seated is seated and people do not notice the degree of intensity with which he sits. This is permissible in ordinary life where there is no need to make such fine distinctions. But it is not permissible in dealing with the organism of nerves and senses. If we run fast, if our limb organism moves fast, then in our nerves and senses organism, there is a stronger desire to be at rest than if we were sauntering along slowly. Gee, I wonder if that's why the world's moving so fast that so many of us wish we could escape and just rest or go to the country. Or the people that can't stop because they're addicted to velocity and motion that the these things are happening in the world the the force us to lay low and relax and chill out and lay back. Okay, back to Steiner. Um, stronger desire to be at rest than if we were sauntering along slowly. And everything that happens in our limb organism 
or indeed in our metabolic organism, when, for example, the digestive fluids are being kept alive by intestinal movements, produces a tendency to rest in our nerves and sense organism. The fact comes to expression externally, as we know. I want to comment that Steiner, in his agricultural lectures, he does make some kind of comment. Does it always have to boil down to like eating and drinking um, in the macrobiotic health eating diet thing? And I think Steiner said something like that, too, that, you know, if you eat too much or you have like the wrong food combinations, too much energy has to go to your stomach to work with it and digest it. That's a problem with drinking beer uh, and alcohol is that it really get, gets that metabolic going and one can't think really or one is railroaded into certain uh, forms of dead-end thinking. Okay, so let's go on now with Rudolf Steiner. The head, the principal seat of the nerves and senses organism, is a lazy bones compared with the limb organism. It behaves much like a man who sits in a cab and lets himself be drawn along by the horse. The man is at rest. And so does our head sit quietly on the rest of our organism. The head is not even interested if, for instance, I wave my arms. When I wave my left arm, a tendency to rest is set up in the right half of my head. And to this tendency to rest, is to be ascribed our ability to accompany our movements with thoughts and ideas. It is quite a mistaken notion of materialistic philosophy that ideas originate from movements in the nerves. On the contrary, if they are ideas about motion in space, they are caused by tendencies to rest in the nervous system. The nervous system quiets down and because it becomes quiet and abates its vital activities, thoughts find their way into the state of rest and become real for us. Anyone who can look at man with the vision of spiritual science and sees what happens when he thinks and when ideas occur to him can never be a materialist, for he knows that in the very same measure that thoughts in their nature as soul and spirit substance, become active and busy. In the same measure do the nerves grow quiet, lose their vitality and energy, and even become numb. The nervous system must cease its material activities before it can make room for the soul and spirit element of thought. Yeah, rather than just sense-bound thinking, right? Very interesting. Okay, Steiner. Materialism dates from the time when science no longer understood matter. For material science is characterized by a total inability to conceive the nature of material occurrences, which it therefore endows with a number of non-existent attributes. This reminds me of the, uh, from the aims of anthroposophy and the purpose of the Gertianum in the first lecture, April 9th, 1923, Steiner saying, if we deepen our inner silence, the spiritual world begins to speak. And real thinking comes out of that. Silence. You know, Steiner talks about emptying the perceptions into your heart <clears throat> and then creating out of nothing. Very similar to creating or generating uh, the idea of becoming a Buddha or Christ like out of emptiness, the Tibetan Buddhists teach. Okay, so let's get back to Mr. Steiner. So um, material science, material, for material science is characterized by a, a total inability to conceive the nature of material occurrences, which it therefore endows with a number of non-existent attributes. So you see there are opposite conditions in man tending toward equilibrium, 
Just as there are present at midsummer natural forces and activities that are directly opposed to those of the depth of winter, so do we find opposing forces in the human organism which, however, hold each other in balance. Yet we shall not think quite correctly about those opposing forces which balance one another until we divide man once more by separating his middle system, the rhythmic system, into two halves, a rhythm of the breath and a rhythm of the blood circulation. Even this discrimination is not exactly accurate, but it is near enough for our purpose and speak of an upper and lower rhythmic system. Between the upper and lower halves is that part of man which, because it is influenced and permeated from above and below by opposite natural forces, strives most energetically to maintain equilibrium. So that man is divided, as it were, into two halves, an upper and a lower. The upper half embraces the nerves and senses system, which extends, of course, over the whole body. The state of things, therefore, which I have to picture is on the one hand a nerves and senses system with a breathing system belonging to it. And on the other hand, the trunk, limbs, and metabolic system with the circulatory system of the blood belonging to it. These two main systems work in opposite directions and cancel one another. Again, Rudolf Steiner is a process of learning. It's not like just one plus one. We're dealing with physical, etheric, astro, ego, sentient, intellect, consciousness, soul, manas, buddhic, atma, or spirit self, life spirit, and spirit human. And these different levels of consciousness will eventually all play into like a one sense of thing. This is me talking, but I just want to say that if you're not understanding Steiner, Rudolf Steiner himself says that by trying to understand him, we're actually creating the supersensible organs of perception that can understand the spirit workings of the world, that can understand ourselves and others and can understand ourselves and others in a sense of the wholeness of ourself and others. And we can understand, we can come to understand what Rudolf Steiner is saying, you know. He says that if you read and understand, you know, three or five of his major books that you can give these talks yourself. Okay. So with that, let's continue with man and the world of stars and spiritual knowledge as a true communion, the beginning, a true communion, the beginning of a cosmic cult suitable for the human being of the present age. The organ in man in which the adjustment takes place, let's get it. The organ in man in which the adjustment takes place, in which there is a continual struggle upwards and downwards to maintain equilibrium. It is the heart. The organ in the human being in which the adjustment takes place, in which there, you know, this is like quoting the tension of opposites in Jungian psychology, you know, like wisdom and compassion in Tibetan Buddhism, spirit and matter me and you, we hold this tension of opposites. And he's implying that where that equilibrium is, that we can hold this creative tension of upward and downward motion, you know, is in the heart. It's like when you walk through the cathedral doors or the Gertianum, we have these three doors, and we walk through the center of the heart, holding the tension of these, of the spirit and mater, or father and mother principle. The organ in human being in which the adjustment takes place, in which there is a continual struggle upwards and downwards to maintain equilibrium, is the human heart, which is far from being a pump as modern physiology would have it. 
for the purpose of pumping blood through the body. It's far from that. It is, on the contrary, the organ which keeps the upper and lower systems in equilibrium. Yeah, breathe into that, I say. Let your breath out and breathe into that idea. If you really want to understand Rudolf Steiner, you know, uh, when you hear things that are really good that inspire you, uh, to, so you can keep that idea and digest it and to kind of understand what you don't understand, when you hear these things, it's really important to like take a deep breath into your heart and learn by heart. Learning by heart isn't just memory work. Learning by heart is getting this intelligent feel for the whole thing. A holistic feel for the okay, I'm talking too much. Let's get back to let's get back to Mr. Steiner. Um therefore even in man's outer physical organism we find an expression of the spiritual events taking place within him, when we observe how summer and winter conditions are incessantly offsetting one another within him. On earth, winter can prevail in one region precisely because summer does not occur at the same time. Otherwise, the summer would balance the winter, that is to say, there would be neither winter nor summer, but only equilibrium. This is the real state of things in the human being. Man is a part of nature. But since the natural forces oppose each other in his organism, they cancel one another, and it is as though... He were a part of nature no longer. But for that very reason, the human being is a free being. Natural laws cannot be applied to him, for in him there is not one set of natural laws, but two, working against one another and canceling each other out. And in this realm, where natural forces cancel one another are to be found, the soul and spirit of man, unaffected by the working of nature, and only to be recognized in their obedience to laws of soul and spirit. I'd like to add here too. This these opposite these these law two laws of nature, isn't that the same as the hermetic as above so below? So this is really the hermetic anthroposophy. As above so below, on earth as it is in heaven. And, and this one set of natural laws, not one set of natural laws, but two, working against each other. But really, they're working for each other when you come to that third holistic, uh, I'm saying. But anyway, I'm just hinting at that. Let's keep going and see what Mr. Steiner says, Dr. Steiner, Rudolf Steiner. From this, you can see what a fundamental change of method is necessary when we come to the observation of the human being and why a mere application of the external laws of nature which are orientated in one direction only, is of no use at all. But now that we have set before us the true nature of man, let us see what results follow. We have seen that man cannot be understood unless he is regarded as being, as bearing within him, as it were, a piece of nature, in such a manner that the counteracting natural forces cancel one another. And if we examine this piece of nature in man with the eyes of spiritual science, we find it to be penetrated as to the physical and etheric bodies during sleep by mineral and vegetable modes of activity, which are seen to be in the summer condition. If we are now able to observe in the right way this budding, sprouting life, we may learn to understand its real significance. When does this budding and sprouting take place? when the ego and astral body are not present, when they are away during sleep. I wonder if meditation too, right? Okay, Steiner. While they're away in, during sleep. And whence comes this budding and sprouting process? That is precisely what spiritual vision shows us. <clears throat> Let us picture man asleep. His physical and etheric bodies lie in the bed. Spiritual vision sees them as soil, as mineral matter, out of which plant life is sprouting. It is a different form of plant life, of course, from the one we see around us, but recognizable as such by spiritual sight. Above gleam the ego and astral body like a flame. 
unable to approach the physical and etheric. Sleeping man, therefore, is a sort of budding, sprouting plot of ground with a gleaming ego, like sunlight, eh? An astral body belonging to it, but detached. And when man is awake, I must describe the state as follows. The mineral and vegetable portions are seen to be withering and collapsing, while the ego and astral body gleam down into them, and as it were, burn them up. Now this, I thought, was really bizarre. I mean, it's or peculiar, prescient. That Steiner says that in that terminology. This is the talk right before the Gertiam is burned down. And it's my thinking that it's possible that the person that burnt down the Gertianum, he didn't hear this talk. He was behind the walls, behind the scenes, starting the fire that started to burn the Gertianum down at the very end of this talk. So that would mean very possibly that whoever burnt down the Gertianum attended the talk before on December 30th and very possibly several of the talks before that. So it will be very interesting to read uh, and share with you my comments on that talk. But right now we're in this talk, December 31st, New Year's Eve, and Steiner talking about when the human being is awake, the state of the mineral and vegetable portions seem to be, the physical and etheric, seem to be withering and collapsing while the ego and astral body, you know, this like crystal sun-like being, unconscious or conscious, the ego and the astral body gleam down into him or her and, as it were, burn them up. This is walking man with the mineral matter crumbling within him, the mineral element of man crumbling or digesting, right, or turning into something else. Okay, Steiner. The mineral element of man crumbles during his walking, wait, I'm sorry, his waking hours. There's a sort of plant-like activity which, although quite different in appearance, gives a general and universal impression of autumn foliage of drooping, withering leaves which are dying and vanishing and all through this fading substance big and little flames are gleaming and glowing. These big and little flames are the astral body and the ego which are now living in the physical and etheric body. And when the question arises what happens to these gleaming and glowing flames during sleep when they are separated from the physical and etheric bodies. When this problem is is attacked by the methods of occult science, we find the solution to be a consequence you could yourself draw from a comparison of various descriptions that I have given from time to time. The power which drives away the flame and gleam of the ego and astral body and which is then actively at work in the budding and sprouting vegetable, vegetative life of the summer-like sleeping physical body, and also in its mineral element, causing even that too to evolve a kind of life, so that in the course of its infinitesimal subdividing, it looks like a mass of melting atoms, a continuous mobile mass, everywhere active, fluid, mineral, and yet air-like at all points permeating, permeated by sprouting life. What is this inner life, inner power? It is the reverberating wave of our life before birth, whose pulsations beat upon our physical and etheric bodies during sleep. When we are awake during earthly life, we still the pulsating vibrations. So long as the flame and the gleam of the ego and astral body are united with the physical and etheric bodies, so long as the flame and gleam of the ego and astral body are united with the physical and etheric bodies, we annul those impulses which spring from an existence preceding our earthly life and which we experience during sleep. 
we bring them to quiescence. And now we learn for the first time from an inspection of ourselves how to regard external nature in the right way. For all natural laws and energies affecting external vegetable and mineral nature resemble that which is mineral and vegetable in ourselves, permeated with sprouting life during sleep. And so this means that as our sleeping physical and etheric bodies point to our own past, to a spiritual life in which we lived before birth, so does all external nature that is vegetable or mineral point to a past. As a matter of fact, if we are to, to comprehend aright the natural laws and forces of our external environment, exclusive of the animal element and physical man, we must recognize that they point to the earth's past, to the dying away of the earth, and the thoughts we entertain about external nature are really directed to the dying element in earth existence. Now, if this decaying earth nature is to be brought to life so that it can receive impulses for the future, this can come about in no other way than it does in man, that is to say, by the insertion of soul and spirit into mineral and vegetable, the insertion of soul and spirit into mineral and vegetable, earth nature is to be brought to life so that it can receive impulses for the future. In the case of the animals, the soul element enters in, and then with man, spirit enters in. Looked at it this way, in this way, the whole world may be said to be divided into two parts. When we look out upon an external nature, in so far as this is mineral and vegetable, and these constitute the principal part of it, we can compare it only with our sleeping physical and etheric organism. When we consider external physical activities, we must admit that all of them depend upon the physical activities in mineral and vegetable matter. Consider the process of nourishment. It begins with the taking in of mineral and vegetable matter. The animal takes it a step further in preparing it as food for man. But as but all external nature depends, so far as its physical and etheric activities are concerned, on such an order of things as we find in our sleeping physical and etheric organism. Now in man, the ego and astral organism which we bear within us, and which during our waking moments, while our physical and etheric organism is in its winter sleep, is in a condition of summer, being stimulated by the outer senses and the thoughts that form themselves. This ego and astral organism balance in waking hours the winter condition of the physical and etheric bodies. And when we come to apply the methods of spiritual science to the cycle of the year, we find in it too a spiritual summer condition belonging to its winter and a spiritual winter condition belonging to the summer. These conditions do not, however, balance one another as they do in the human being. On the contrary, they express themselves in opposite hemispheres so that on the earth, physical winter is strengthened by the winter of the soul and spirit and physical summer by spiritual summer. Nevertheless, these occurrences point to the fact that all surrounding nature bears within it its past and its future even as the human being does. We have actually the present only in waking hours in our physical body in respect to its activities and laws. For during the sleep of our physical and etheric bodies, we experience the inward, the inworking of a past, a past, moreover, that was spent in the spiritual world. We find the same thing in the vegetable and mineral worlds so that we see them before us and experience their effects upon us. They too are a result of past experience, and they only become present through the earth being permeated with soul and spirit, even as man is. I want to comment, this has <clears throat> perhaps very important, like right at that moment, you know, you, you look at what you're looking at, 
and take a deep breath to your heart because there's a certain amount of truth to the fact of the upper third of your body and lower third in the middle, the heart. When you think with your head, as soon as you think it, it's past. And it's only by holding still and sinking into the heart, the mind holding still and thinking into the heart, with that in-breath, do we become present. And that everything, I'm talking now, everything that is in the lower third of our body with um, food, digestion, exercise, metabolic, will, sex, is future, is future orientated. And that the present really is in the, the middle, holding that tension between those opposites. I'm adding this to that. And I want to also add that you have like fall in the northern hemisphere and spring in the southern hemisphere. But in the course of a year, if you could breathe with the course of a year and watch the breath breathe out from the earth and back in. In the course of a year, you that's the easiest way to form clairvoyance and to find the true nature of the Christ. Align ourselves. That's what Steiner says in the Cosmic and Human Metamorphosis that I talked about earlier. So I'm probably bringing together perhaps a little much, but under the hand, if we take, let go of our breath and take a breath and be still and know just uh, just let this kind of knowledge compost in the heart until it rises with new, a renewed wisdom, Sophia, the resurrected Sophia, right? Bringing Sophia back from idle space, dead space, to the real ground, the earth, the heart. Okay. We have actually the present only in waking hours in our physical body in respect to its activities and laws. For during the sleep of our physical and etheric bodies, we experience the in-working of a past, a past, moreover, that was spent in the spiritual world. We find the same thing in the vegetable and mineral worlds as we see them before us <clears throat> and experience their effects upon us. They too are the result of past experience. And they only become present through the earth being permeated with soul and spirit, even as man is. Yeah, when you breathe bottoms up, top down, the spirit of the world comes in to your heart, top down, and bottoms up, the soul comes and we meet in the heart. Earth only become present through the earth being permeated with soul and spirit, even as man is, that Stan is saying. <clears throat> and in the present is contained the germ of the future. In other words, the present is the child of the past and the mother and father of the future. And that would be in the heart, I say. So back to Steiner. The present is contained in the present is contained the germ of the future. But it is true, and the description I have given you is true, that our physical and etheric organism is an expression of the past precisely when it is independent of the activities of the soul and spirit. Then, in order to find that which works over into the future, we must look into our ego and astral body, and for the earth, too, we must seek the future in that which is spiritual. Man has evolved <clears throat> to a point when, by help of forces which, of course, are quite elemental, he has brought the ego and astral body into companionship with his physical and etheric bodies. The mineral and vegetable world has not yet accomplished this. The earth's ego and astral body surround the earth with soul and spirit, but do not permeate her mineral and vegetable activities. The mineral nature of the earth, as observed by us, shows itself unable to let soul and spirit enter into it and able only to let them surround it with light. The vegetable nature shows itself also unable to admit soul. But in a certain way, the upper parts of the plant may be said to be touched with soul and spirit. Spiritual science gives us the following picture of a plant. If I draw it 
with the root below and stem in the middle and the blossom above, then I have to represent it as in contact with the astral world through its blossom. The astral world does not penetrate the plant. It merely touches it. And this touching is the origin of the blossom. The astral substance surrounding the earth touches the uppermost portion of the plant and the flower appears. I have often spoken of this in an analogy, which must of course be received with proper delicacy, saying that the flowering of the plant is the kiss exchanged between the sun's light and the plant. It is an astral influence in which there is no more than a touching. I think, <clears throat> I think that in our meditations of stillness, take letting all of our breath out <clears throat> and breathing it in, emptying everything into the heart, <clears throat> and with the stillness of the heart, listening to the stillness within ourselves and the world. You know, we're trying to be kissed with our higher self. You know, the spiritual teachings just kind of spiritual beings just touching our highest quality heart. So Steiner says, I've spoken, often spoken of this in an analogy, which must, of course, be received with proper delicacy, saying that the flowering of the plant is the kiss exchanged between the sun's light and the plant. It is an astral influence in which there is no more than a touching. So that when we look into surrounding nature, we do not see in the mineral and vegetable kingdoms exactly what we see in man. In ourselves, as man, we behold a mineral nature, a plant nature, an astral nature, and an ego nature, all belonging to one another. We will leave the animals out for the time being and speak of them on some uh, future occasion. But we have to see in the mineral and vegetable world themselves that on which physical activity essentially depends. These worlds show themselves in external nature, although lacking in astral thought, as well as in self-conscious spiritual intelligence, which is the product of the ego. The latter are not to be found in the world outside, neither in the mineral nor in the plant. For mineral and plant are fundamentally results of the past. If we observe, and I observe that we should go on to, we should stop here <clears throat> for the thrilling conclusion, which should be rather short, we'll stop here and go to the next talk and of Rudolf Steiner's here, and um, this is Robert Thibodeau of MayflowerBookshop.com. Uh, the first half of spiritual knowledge is a true spiritual knowledge is the true communion, the beginning of a cosmic brotherhood sisterhood, right? A family human suitable for the human beings of the present age. Rudolf Steiner's talk, New Year's Eve, nineteen twenty-two, ending. After ending this talk, the fire of the Gertianum, first Gertianum was burnt, and this is his talk, Spiritual Knowledge is a True Communion, the beginning of a cosmic cult suitable for the manas of the present age. Bless your heart, and I'll see you in the next little talk. <clears throat>